Good evening. Uh, my name is Lynn Hollander Savio, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Mario Savio Memorial Lecture and Young Activist Award, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 14th Memorial Lecture. <clears throat> As most of you, I hope, know, Mario Savio was a leading spokesperson for the free speech movement, a movement that in 1964 won political freedom for the students of the University of California and ignited a firestorm of campus protest across the United States. Upon Mario's too early death in 1996, colleagues, friends, and family inaugurated this lecture series, and also an award to honor young activists as a tribute to his memory, to the other activists of the 60s generation who fought for civil liberties, civil rights, and peace, and to advance the ideas and values that they championed. In the years since we began, we have presented an array of outstanding progressive speakers including Howard Zinn, who gave our first lecture, Cornell West, Molly Ivins, Amy Goodman, and last year, Naomi Klein. We are excited tonight to bring you another speaker who truly exemplifies through her work one of Mario's favorite bumper strips. Elizabeth Warren does indeed speak truth to power. We want to thank the University Library, the Goldman School of Public Policy, Bol <laughs> Bolt Hall Law School, the Free Speech Movement Cafe, and the Graduate Assembly for their support of this series. And a special thank you to the staff of the Martin Luther King Jr. Student Union for the many years they've helped us to stage this event. We also want to thank those of you in the audience whose contributions have helped make this and previous lectures and awards possible. We're very grateful for your ongoing support. To those of you who are just finding out about us, we hope that when you leave tonight, you will give what you can to the people collecting donations at the doors, or leave some extra cash in the refreshment, at the refreshment table or at the book table in the lobby. We especially urge you to buy a copy of the excellent biography of Mario, written by Robert Cohn, Freedom's Orator, Mario Savio and the Radical Legacy of the 1960s. It's a really terrific book. We're selling it for $25, which is less than the price at Amazon, so it's a bargain, as well as being an excellent read. Uh, also. Um, I didn't see them, but there are supposed to be tables for political groups in the lobby, and uh, our hope is that these lectures inspire people to become involved in the causes that matter to them. And so you want to check out those tables if they're there. And don't forget to vote on Tuesday, even if the choices are not inspiring. People, it does make a difference. The other guys would not have created a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, nor appointed Elizabeth Warren to set it up. So vote, please. OK, one last housekeeping item. The agenda for tonight is as follows. We will show a short video of Mario. Uh, Mark, did you? Arrange that. You couldn't do it. Okay. We were going to show the, what's his name? Oh, uh, we were going to show the Elizabeth Warren rap, but it was a little uh, too last minute to do that. So anyway, you can go on YouTube and find the Elizabeth Warren rap. Um, it's very funny. <laughs> At this time, we would like to present the Mario Savio Young Activist Award. This award was established to recognize those young people 
who have committed themselves to building a more humane society. It seeks to help and encourage emerging activists to sustain their commitment, providing both recognition and a little financial assistance, both of which are too often in short supply when you work for social change. The award currently is $6,000, with half going to the individual and the other half to his or her organization. I should mention that this year, as well as next, the award is being funded by the band Lincoln Park, whose controversial new album, A Thousand Sons, includes a clip of Mario's Body Upon the Gears speech. Each year, when we receive the nominations for the award, we are amazed by the outstanding work that young people are doing all over the country to improve people's lives. This year, we want to recognize two young immigration reform activists from the city of Chicago, 19-year-old Raina Wences and 22-year-old Rigo Padilla. Although Rigo and Raina did not become close friends until they met at the University of Illinois, Chicago, their story followed the same trajectory. Both were brought to Chicago as children by families seeking better lives. Both became honor students. It was not until Raina was unable to travel to Quebec for a high school honors class trip and Rigo began applying to college that they each realized how severely their undocumented status impacted their lives. Raina, for example, was unable to accept a $25,000 four-year scholarship to the college of her choice because of the impossibility of getting loans for the rest of the costs. But the crunch did not come until Rigo received a deportation notice. Rather than flee, agree to deportation, or simply seek administrative remedies, Rigo, with Reina as a spokesperson, took his case to the world. Their effective advocacy resulted in an endorsement of Rigo's case by the mayor of Chicago and the city council and the support of five U.S. congressmen. Eventually, the campaign resulted in a one-year stay of deportation for Rigo, a stay that is up in December of this year. As they became more involved in the campaign, it dawned on the two students that they were not fighting for Rigo alone, but also for the thousands of other undocumented students who exist in limbo, unable to live freely and fully in the only country they know as home. A year ago, at a rally for Rigo, Reina, the first speaker, stood up and declared herself undocumented and unafraid. Reina and Rigo went on to co-found the Immigrant Youth Justice League and continue their grassroots organizing. They participated in leadership training and developed and led workshops and activism for hundreds of other undocumented youth. Then, drawing on the slogan of the LGBT movement, they began to plan, first locally and then nationally, a coming out of the shadows day, which sent thousands of young people to Washington and into the streets in their local communities to raise their voices on behalf of the DREAM Act, legislation which would permit youth brought to this country as children to earn citizenship through education or military service. One after another, these young people walked to the podium and proclaimed, my name is Tanya and I am undocumented and unafraid. My name is David and I am undocumented and unafraid. My name is Hugo and I am undocumented and unafraid. Reina and Rigo's organizing has been particularly noteworthy for their successful efforts to build alliances with other organizations in their community, including African American, Asian American, and LGBT groups, and also for the open democratic process by which their own Immigrant Youth Justice League is run. One of the people who nominated Rigo and Reina 
is a free speech movement veteran who wrote us, watching them reminded me like nothing else ever has of what I saw on my way to class one day in 1964, an impassioned Mario Savio standing on top of a car, imploring the rest of us to open our eyes to injustice and changing the way that we view the world. In choosing to give a public voice to thousands of undocumented youth, Reina and Rigo risked their personal safety and security and that of their immediate families. Their courage in speaking out and their thoughtful, effective leadership has inspired a national movement for undocumented youth to come forward out of the shadows to declare themselves undocumented but unafraid to raise their voices for meaningful and just reform of a broken immigration system. And we are delighted to award Reina Wences and Rigoberto Padilla Perez this year's Mario Savio Young Activist Award. So I am, I am, the check has already been sent. Uh, I uh, am giving them this uh, certificate. This one is presented to Raina Wences, Immigrant Youth Justice League, to honor her deep commitment to human rights and social justice and her ability to transform this commitment into effective action. And Rigo gets the same. And they also each get a copy of this excellent book, <laughs> Freedom's Orator. Okay. Read it. <laughs> okay. So uh, they're going to talk to they're going to talk to us for a bit. A little bit nervous. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I would first like to start off by saying that I believe, honestly believe that anybody in our organization could have been here with us and I really wish that there was like 10 awards so any, everybody, everybody would have won it. Um, with that said, um, like they said, my name is Rigo Padilla and I am undocumented. For the past 16 years, I have lived in the United States. I saw myself, growing up in the United States, I saw myself being, not being any different from the rest of my friends. Uh, we all grew up in the same neighborhood, played on the same soccer team, we're in the same honors programs. But regardless of how much I tried to, to fit in, I knew I was different. At first, I could not travel to the University of Arizona for a summer program, nor get my driver's license when I was a sophomore. Um, I did not qualify for federal or state financial aid. And as of now, I am a semester away from graduating from the University of Illinois Chicago with a bachelor's in Latin American and Latino studies. And once again, I find myself in the same situation that I found myself in as a senior in high school, knowing that I am undocumented, that I have a glass ceiling, and that I am not allowed to continue my education because there is limited resources, because there is no state or federal aid for me. My future, once again, is in limbo, and my dreams of going to graduate school and then on to law school can be potentially put on hold. Last year, when I was facing deportation, to be sent back to a country that I hardly knew and had not been back since the age of six, um, I, was, I knew that I was in deportation and I started going to immigration attorneys and to national organizations and every single organization and every single attorney until I got to 11 told me that my best option was to go back. So I was faced with the situation of, that I, I was faced with two options of going back or fighting back and I chose to fight back. After a year long campaign that consisted of numerous rallies, two city resolutions, five letters from Congress people, a private bill, 
25,000 faxes being sent to the Department of Homeland Security, and a third of civil disobedience by nuns in front of ICE offices. <laughs> Stop my deportation. This happened three days before I was supposed to go back to Mexico. I had bought a plane ticket, but I had not packed my bags. I was determined to stay, and I knew I was going to stay regardless. But after my campaign, a group of undocumented students that had been working on my campaign and I realized that we had to continue mobilizing, that we could no longer live in fear of being sent back to a country that we hardly knew, of being detained for X amount of time. That, that we had to speak for ourselves, that we had to continue our struggle to have our own urgency and to be part of the decision making that affected our lives. We also knew that we needed to create a safe space that, would, that we could share our frustrations and know that we could push, that we could push to change the situation. It is for that reason they have been, that we have been engaging in civil disobedience because we have seen the DREAM Act fail year after year since 2001. Thank you. Good evening, good night. Um, my name is Reina Wences, I'm undocumented. Last year, I was probably sitting in my living room thinking about my homework, but I was also thinking about Regal, because by this time last year, I was involved in Regal's campaign. And what happened was that one day, I was just sitting around with my friend Tanya, who's also part of the Immigrant Youth Justice League, and she deserves to be here as well. And I met this guy, undocumented, you know. I knew what it meant. But what was different is that he was scheduled to leave within a few months. I saw myself in him. I saw myself in him because I'm undocumented as well. And it only takes two, one, two things to be sent back to a country that you don't know. To be at the wrong place at the wrong time, or to make a mistake and have your life be defined for the forever. Last year, I was also frustrated because I had started my first semester in college at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and I didn't have the money to pay for my first semester. So battling between classes, Rigo's campaign, economic issues, I just decided to do the same that Rigo did and fight back, and I decided not to go back to school because I knew that my time, my energy, would be better off helping myself and also my community. I needed to create those options that undocumented people don't have. And that's what Immigrant Youth Justice League is doing right now. We're not just, it's not just the Immigrant Youth Justice League, but it's also a whole national movement that is not pushing just for comprehensive immigration reform, but we're pushing for the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act will legalize us, will legalize people through education or militarization. I'm sorry. Um, it, it doesn't... I was watching the video right now, and something hit me. It hit me that I found my voice, just like Mario did. And I am emotional because it's the best feeling in the world to be able to say who you are, to be able to say that you're a human being and that you do deserve to be happy. And I think that's what Mario was getting at. I may be undocumented, but I'm no different than any of you here. My options are limited, but I'm asking you to help us. It doesn't end here. Help other people find their voice, just like we did. It doesn't end here. It's about humanity. It's about realizing that we all deserve the right to be happy and that we all have that pursuit of happiness. 
And I would like to ask you, and I would like to invite you, that tonight, when you leave, when you're at home, think about whether you have your voice, or think about that if you do have your voice, who would you like to help get their voice? This is about humanity. This isn't just about the DREAM Act. This isn't just about immigration. This is about forming, creating a better future and society for all of us. And just like Maria did, I think it's safe to say that we're gonna be doing the same for the rest of our lives. Thank you so much. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Maria Echeveste, uh, a lecturer at Bolt Hall, who will introduce Elizabeth Warren. Thank you. Thank you, so much. And thank, you. thank you to our, our students um, for that really moving speech and reminding us that um, what we're celebrating here and what we're going to hear from Elizabeth, Professor Elizabeth Warren is about finding your voice. And as Lynn said earlier, Elizabeth um, has certainly a spoken truth to power. And we expect and uh, understand that she's going to be taking on a huge role. So what I want to say is um, her bio is illustrious. And you, in this high-tech age, you can look it up on Wikipedia, which is an amazing invention. But she is a law professor who got a law degree from Rutgers, taught um, Pennsylvania, Texas, and joined the Harvard Law Faculty in 1992. And I um, want to share a couple of stories about how I met Elizabeth because I think that it reflects that she was working in an area where many people, especially in the academic world, were not focused on, which is what um, are the consequences of bankruptcy on working class and middle class families? And it just so happened that at the time I was working in the White House and we, uh, under the Clinton administration um, in 97, 98, there was a bankruptcy reform bill that was being proposed by the credit card companies. And um, someone suggested to me the dean of UC Berkeley now, but was faculty at Harvard, Christopher Edley, said, you should talk to my colleague, Elizabeth Warren. She knows a lot about why people go into bankruptcy. Uh, because what was going on was that the credit card companies in particular wanted um, their debt to be protected and not be discharged. And Elizabeth had all the data about why people were going into bankruptcy. And it wasn't deadbeats or failure to be responsible. It was about life-changing issues such as divorce, such as health. And I'm proud to say that at least while we had President Clinton, we kept the bankruptcy reform bill, but it got passed in um, 2002 or 2004. Um, the second thing is that when the bailout, that bailout in 2007, 2008, the crisis, it is amazing to me and I, that billions of dollars were directed toward major corporations with no restrictions, with no expectations about what these banks, what these institutions were going to do. And Fortunately, um, Elizabeth Warren was appointed to the new um, consumer, the um, uh, oversight committee for a congressionally appointed oversight committee to look at TARP. Again, watching out for all of us. And so it is with great, great uh, pride to, to welcome Elizabeth, to have her share her thoughts about taking on this role of helping to set up, for the first time, a consumer protection financial agency. 
that was part of the financial reform bill that was passed in Congress, and which was her idea. She's given it a lot of thought, in which there are many, many forces, and I'm very familiar with Washington, many forces arrayed against her, not to have either this agency or to have her play a role in standing it up. And so we should be very, very proud of the fact that a person like Elizabeth Warren is taking on this job for all of us. Thank you, Elizabeth. I want to thank you all very much. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Maria. I appreciate the, the kind invitation. Thank you very much for inviting me here tonight in this opportunity to give a lecture dedicated to the memory of a man who told truth to power and who symbolized a generation's attempt to bring change to our country. I am, I am deeply honored to be here, to be on this campus, to be with you, and in any way to have my work associated with the work of Mario Savio. And so I am grateful. I, I'm also going to say, I hope tonight you will bear with me. I am um, I'm someone who usually just comes and talks. Uh, I have bullet points in mind uh, and points I want to make, but I now live in a world where someone has to read my speech in advance. <laughs> and so I have to stick a little bit to a script. And so uh, that's a little bit of a challenge for me, but at least I can say this, I wrote it. So, um, so that's right. And we will have a Q&A afterwards. Uh, so let me tell you what I want to tell you, and that is, I agreed to do this lecture a year ago, and when I agreed to do it, my life was very different. Uh, by day, I was a mild-mannered law professor, uh, teaching contracts to first-year students. Uh, I also served at that time as the chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel for the Troubled Assets Relief Program, and I tried hard to ask questions on behalf of American families, and I put some very tough questions to the administrators of the TARP program, both before and after the administration changed hands. Um, by night, however, I was a dogged volunteer, speaking with anyone who would listen about the tricks and traps hidden in the fine print of mortgages, credit cards, remittances, and other consumer credit contracts. And wearing that hat, I knocked on doors in Washington, I wrote op-eds, and I pushed as hard as I could for Congress to create a new consumer agency in the aftermath of a financial crisis. I was not the only one pushing hard. There were many bodies upon the gears, as Mario put it. Uh, hundreds of concerned citizens and groups who worked around the clock to make sure that powerful interests didn't quietly kill consumer protection and that we got a vote on a serious, tough new agency. We wanted an up or down vote so that everyone could see whether Congress supported an agency that would be a voice for families. We got our vote, and that's when things changed. Despite the fact that hordes of lobbyists had fought us every inch of the way, over the summer, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act with our tough little agency playing a starring role. On July 21st, the President signed the bill into law and announced to Americans that there will now be, quote, a new consumer watchdog with just one, one job, looking out for people, not big banks, not lenders, not investment houses, looking out for people as they interact with the financial system. For the first time in our history, there would be an agency devoted solely to the economic strength of American families. Now, last month, President Obama asked that I serve as an assistant to the President 
and Secretary Geithner asked that I help him stand up the Consumer Bureau so that we could get to work on giving consumers a voice and getting rid of the tricks and the traps in the fine print on credit products. I'll say tonight, changes come from many directions. Uh, some of you in this room know me and know that I have two little granddaughters who are the light of my life. Um, just hours ago, baby number three arrived in our family. I didn't do any work. Um, and uh, little boy. And uh, when I leave here tomorrow morning, I'm going to fly to Los Angeles, and I will see him for the first time. While in Los Angeles, I will also make good on my ironclad contract with no fine print uh, to take two little girls trick-or-treating. And, uh, uh, and I dress along with the girls. So, um, but, but the reason I mention this is what I want to talk about tonight. This is actually related, um, it, it, right? I'm not just somebody who gets a chance to talk about her grandchildren. Um, although, um, like my grandson, I am going to make this connection. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is in its infancy. What I want to talk about tonight is what it means to begin something, to be at the front end of something. Um, tonight is really about new beginnings. So I want to tell you the speech I usually give. I'll give you the short version of the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. When I talk about the new agency, I usually talk about the very specific changes it can make for families. I talk about a broken credit card, a uh, broken credit market in which fine print rains down on families, making it nearly impossible for anyone without a law degree, an accounting degree, and a hundred hours to spend to determine the true cost of credit or to make straightforward comparisons among products, or to determine something as basic as which one is the cheapest. I talk about significant changes that are already in place, uh, like the CARD Act, which uh, became law when President Obama, uh, uh, when President Obama signed the law uh, in uh, the spring of 2009, and it now bans some of the most abusive credit card practices. Right now, that law is making millions of American families a little bit more secure. Uh, there are companies that describe it in terms of how it is cutting into their revenue. Uh, and the way I like to think about that is it's leaving money in the hands of American families. And that's going on day by day, right this minute. I talk about significant other changes. But what I do is I usually ask people to imagine a clean, competitive credit market, a place with no fine print to hide tricks and traps, and to think about how that makes life different for American families. I talk about how this agency can make families economically safer every chance I get. But tonight, I want to break some new ground. I want to reflect on what it means to be at the beginning to think about the possibilities for a stand-up agency. Pause to consider this. We are building a new federal agency from the ground up. We should think broadly about credit and about American families, but we also have a moment right now to think about what it means to build a new agency in a world where information travels at the speed of light. In our early republic, the government was not distant from the people that it governed. Uh, the New England Town Hall was emblematic of a world in which those who ran government were well known as neighbors, as kinsmen, and as friends. That made sense in a world in which commerce was largely local. The mill, the livery, the bank were just down the lane. Politics was also very close. Those who served in government and those who needed the services of government were closely related. Fast forward to the 20th century. Commerce was no longer predominantly local, but national. Industrial manufacturing displaced individual craftsmen. Scientific management routinized creative work. And finance began its march toward consolidation and larger and larger banks. Theodore Roosevelt famously tried to adapt Washington to the changes he saw in commerce. 
Only a strong national government, he thought, could effectively balance against the influence of powerful national industries. Government agencies were created and professional public servants began to emerge, working on behalf of the people. Now, we may take it for granted, but I feel like people don't say this often enough. We've all profited from the rise of government agencies watching out for our welfare. In a world in which it's quite popular to talk about what government does wrong, to talk about where government fails, where it stumbles, stop to think what government has done for us in the quiet agencies that work on our behalf. The Food and Drug Administration monitors the safety of our drugs. The Consumer Product Safety Commission makes sure that toys covered in lead and uh, seats, car seats, infant car seats that might collapse are kept away from our children. And the Environmental Protection Agency tests the safety of the air we breathe and the water we drink. We may criticize these agencies for not doing as much as we think they should, but the reality is, think of the world and how different it is with no agencies at all in those areas, with no one to watch out, with no one to balance the power of those who would come in and sell us the products, pollute our water, make our air unbreathable. That's been the area in consumer credit. Um, we've had no one. We've had a hodgepodge of laws here and there. Um, but we've had nothing until this agency came along. Now, this agency could be born in the same form, in the same format as other agencies. But those same agencies that have seemed distant from us, that were created in the 20th century, have often seemed faceless, nameless, and distant, much like the industries they regulate. In the early 20th century, in a world in which communication capacities had increased only marginally from a century earlier, a world in which letters and newspapers were the main source of dialogue between agencies and people, that structure was the best we could do. We sent experts to Washington and asked Washington to watch out on our behalf. Today, we can imagine an agency designed for the 21st century and for a new world of commerce in, in, in consumer financial products. So let me see if I can talk that through a little. Today, information is king. But information is not evenly accessed by all. Repeat players can understand complicated financial product that the rest of us have difficulty parsing in full. Lenders can hire teams of lawyers to work out every detail in a contract. Then they can replicate it millions of times. A consumer doesn't have the same options. And with technology to keep track of every purchase, to watch every payment choice, to observe and record the rhythms of our lives, a sophisticated seller can harvest that information, sometimes in ways that provide value, but sometimes in ways that manipulate customers who will never see what happened to them. We can build a government agency that is responsive to the dynamics of our time, just as the town meeting uh, was responsive to the 18th century and the classic government agency to the, four, to the 20th century. But to get there, we need to imagine a consumer agency using changes in technology as a way to propel us. I can think of no place to do better reimagining than here in the Bay Area, in the place that is the birth of the free speech movement, and home to so many companies that have transformed the ways we communicate. So I'm gonna pose three questions to get us started, to think about how, in a world of technology, we might build a different agency on behalf of the American people. And the first question I think about is who has a voice? Who has a seat at the table? The industry hires lobbyists and lawyers, who produce papers and research and who monitor everything that happens. The industry pushes its views to the agency and the public about the right direction that the agency should go. And not surprisingly, the right direction always turns out to be the one that is good for industry. That's the industry's right, but for the American public, 
those who aren't hiring the lobbyists and the lawyers, the field is tilted against them. The public, the people to be served, far too often fade into the background. When the agency lose sight of the public it is designed to serve, then academics describe it as captured. The new consumer agency can develop tools to help level the playing field and to discourage this capture. The American people can have not just one, but thousands of seats at the table. Even before the agency officially opens its doors, it can solicit information from the American people about the challenges and frustrations that they face with consumer financial products day in and day out. And it can organize that information and put it to good use now. Data from the public can help inform priorities and it can signal problems both to consumers and to business. Information technology can allow us to hang out a virtual shingle in front of the agency and to declare our intent to the world. It's a lot harder to let yourself fail and a lot easier for the public to hold you accountable when you've transparently declared your mission and shared information the public can use to measure your success in meeting it. Technology can force this agency to remain true to its goals. Transparency is obviously key and we're ready to get started. But as part of this, I'm prepared to commit that making public the advocates, lawyers, and other, to making public to the advocates, to the lawyers, to the stakeholders, who it is who comes and talks to this agency. And making public that this agency gets, uh, from the beginning, belongs to the people who built it. This agency belongs to the American people, and they have a seat at the table in every part of the decision-making process. You know, you're, you're kind, and I, I leave my, my, my printed remarks here for a minute, because I want to think about this. I, I, I hate being tied to something. It, I know, it, I feel like this is a boring speech, but the reality is, no, but the reality is, if we don't get this right, we really blow a big opportunity here. And so the first part of this really is, who owns this agency? I've been in Washington for four and a half weeks now, and I figured out who thinks they own the agency, even though they never wanted it to come into existence. And so I'm struggling. This is, these are the issues. My, my problem is not where do we need to make changes in the credit market. Those are hard questions. But they're questions I spent a lot of time thinking about. The hard part now is the question of how you make sure that when you build an agency, it's not nameless and faceless, and that it, own, that it is owned by the people it is supposed to serve. And so I ask the question, can technology change it? Is there something that we can do today that we couldn't do 20 years ago or 80 years ago when we built other agencies to give ownership to the people who care about this agency. And so that's why I asked the first question. How do we use technology to see who gets a seat at the table? How do we make sure that there are thousands of seats for the American people? Second part, how does the agency use information better in order to do its job? And here's what I've thought about. In a world of experts, it's experts that frame the question to be asked, to isolate the problems, to sort through the data if there are any, and to try to design solutions, always with the industry looking on and always with the industry chiming in. It's work. It's better than not having agencies. But we can do better. A data-driven agency won't be about conventional wisdom. It will be about data, what's really happening. And those data should come from many sources, from financial institutions, from academic studies, and from our own, the agency's independent research. We can reinforce that approach by making sure that our analysts come from a diversity of backgrounds, from finance, from law, from economics, from sociology, from housing, my husband would point out, from history. Um, 
but it is. It's the case it should come. The people who analyze the data and try to understand the problems need to come from a lot of different perspectives. But we can also gather data directly from the American people by asking them to volunteer to share with us the experiences they have had with consumer credit products. We can open up our platform to American families across the country who want to tell us what has happened to them when they've used credit cards, when they've tried to pay off student loans, or when they've worked to correct errors in a credit report. We can learn more about the loan application process, about what people see on the front end and what happens on the back end. We can learn about good practices, bad practices, and downright dangerous practices. And we can report on the good, the bad, and the ugly to increase transparency and ultimately to push in the right direction. Now, normally, agencies use supervision and lawsuits to enforce the law. And this agency will do that. It will be a cop on the beat watching huge credit card companies and local payday lenders and everyone in between. Technology, however, can help us do that better by making sure that our enforcement priorities are tightly connected to the financial realities as experienced by customers every day. New technology can help us supplement the cop on the beat by building a neighborhood watch. The agency can empower a well-informed population to help expose early on consumer financial tricks. If rules are being broken, if we don't wait for an expert in Washington, we don't need to wait for an expert in Washington to wake up. If we set it up right from the beginning, the agency can collect and analyze data faster and get on top of problems as they occur, not years later. Think about, I have a very specific example here. Think about how much sooner attention could have turned to the foreclosure documentation problem, as it is currently called, robo-signers and notaries, just to, just to pick two. If back, just back in 2007 and 2008, there had been a consumer agency in place to blow the whistle before the problem reached the proportions that it has now reached and become a national scandal. So the notion of collecting data and reporting on those data, getting those data back into the public dialogue immediately can change the work of the agency. The agency may also be able to demonstrate how incentives can change when people are connected not only to the government but also to each other. Uh, crowdsourcing technology uh, may enable consumers to deal collectively with those who would take advantage of them and can reward those who provide excellent products and services. So imagine being able to scan a credit agreement and uploading it to a website where software can analyze the text of the agreement. A consumer could help the agency spot new agreements on the market and customers could get more information as they make decisions. The new Card Act, for example, requires credit card issuers to submit their agreements to the Federal Reserve for posting. I think that's a model we can build on and then start to use. The idea here is that information, fast, accurate information from a variety of sources analyzed by a variety of different people has the power to transform the old measures of agency effectiveness. And then the third question, the perfect one for a university. Who has the next breakthrough idea? If any of you have read my academic work, you know that I built an entire career um, teasing a few crumbs of data out of the federal system uh, and trying uh, and generating some data of my own and trying to make sense of what was happening economically to American families. As a researcher, I understand that data must always be handled carefully. This is our disclaimer, and protection of personal data and proprietary models is paramount. But I also believe that data made available to the media, private investors, scholars, and others will, over time, produce better results. When data are widely shared, others can use those data 
to uncover new problems, to frame those problems in different ways, to propose their own public policy solutions and for the entrepreneurs in the group to develop their own private apps to create something of value. I've seen some good ideas in my time, and I've learned that those ideas can come from some pretty unlikely places. I'm hopeful that as we drive consumer credit markets toward working better for families, the new consumer agency will be smart enough to encourage and then to build on the good ideas that come from far outside the government sphere. So think for a minute, again, about how more and better data might have helped us avoid the finance crash of 2008, a crash that has resulted now in millions of foreclosures and has cost American families trillions of dollars. Better access to better data could have empowered those on the outside to blow the lid off a faulty housing model and to do it before terms like too big to fail entered our everyday vocabulary. Now, these are only three ideas, but notice how they work together. An agency that isn't captured by industry can write better rules and enforce those rules more vigorously. An agency that shares data is an agency that's hard to capture. And an agency that learns from families is an agency that makes markets work better. We fought to get here. And those who tried to block the agency's creation have already said they will be back. Every single day, they spend money to try to find a way to cut back on the agency's power, even before it has begun work. But we're scrappy. Partly because we have no choice. But here's what I believe. This agency can succeed. More importantly, it must succeed because we are running out of time. For more than a generation, we have witnessed a steady deterioration in the economic security of the middle class. Flat wages and rising core expenses caught families in the crossfire, and millions turned to debt only to learn that the friendly advertisements were an invitation to disaster. We are in an economic crisis, but remember that it is a crisis that has been decades in the making. Long ago, when America was committed to building a robust middle class. An economic boom meant prosperity for working people. In the boom of the 1960s, real income for the median family in the United States rose by 37% in inflation-adjusted dollars. Think about that, from the beginning of the boom to the end of the boom. By the 2000s, economic expansion meant prosperity only for a few. The boom that preceded the crash of 2008, median income rose by a paltry 1.9%. That was it. And by the way, for workers under 50, no rise at all. That was captured only by older workers. Worker productivity went up in the boom, and those at the top got wealthier and wealthier, while those in the middle were barely holding on to their old paychecks. Just think about that. 37% real growth in good times in the 1960s, and the best you could do was 1.9% growth in real income uh, in the 2000s. Anyone who wants to understand why America's middle class is not bouncing back from the crash of 2008 should remember that unlike the boom and bust cycles of the past, middle class families this time had no parachute when they were pushed off the cliff in the Great Recession of 2008. Today's families have spent all of their income, spent all of their savings, and taken on debt to pay for college, to cover serious medical problems, 
and just to stay afloat a little bit longer. Although some economists tell us that the recession is over, we all know that the economic pain is not. And we see that whether we measure it in unemployment or foreclosures, whether we count in the small businesses or the students who can't get loans, whether the metric is home sales or manufacturing uh, inventory, the reality is we are in real trouble here. Families have been pushed and squeezed and hammered for a generation. But we have a moment right here, right now, to turn a corner. This new consumer agency won't fix everything, but it gives us an opportunity to plug a very big hole in the bottom of the economic boat for millions of American families. We have a moment in one very tangible way to make something better for millions of hardworking, play by the rules people. So tonight, I talk about the, the hard business of trying to put together a new agency. Uh, and it is tough. Uh, there are a lot of challenges out here. And we don't have a strong constituency to support us, lobbyists who will get out there and fight on our behalf. All we really have is you. We have the people who fought hard for this agency just because they thought it was right, because they believed that they really could make a difference. We have this agency. We have tools in front of us. And together, we have to build it in a way that makes a real difference. We won't fix it all. But if we fix one part and we show that government can do it right, can fix one part, can belong to the people, then we will have built into the DNA of this agency ourselves, our best hopes, and our best dreams for the future. So I'm here tonight about beginnings. I'm going to go see a new grandson. And as soon as I do that, I'm going to get back on an airplane, and I'm going to go back to Washington and do what I can to help give birth to a new agency. And I hope you'll help me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So do I stay here? I stay here. Thank you. Well, first of all, I have to thank you, Elizabeth. Um, thank you, audience members who submitted questions. You kept them real short. There's so many good questions. I have a stack here. So it, your question is not likely to get answered. <laughs> or get asked, but I'll try and do. There um, were several questions that asked about usury laws, and couldn't we reestablish them? And can you uh, set a limit to how high the credit rates okay. can be? So it wouldn't be a lecture from a college professor if I didn't say, <clears throat> there have been three periods in American history on credit. <laughs> Actually, in all of our history, and, and let me tell you what the three periods are. Period number one goes from the 14th century BC, Code of Hammurabi, to 1980. <laughs> it's true. And that's the world in which we had usury laws. Usury laws were the first consumer protection law, and they were there. They are in our various religious traditions, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, uh, they're in all the colonies, they are then in all of the states, and everyone knows the basic premise. You just can't charge more than a certain amount. And the consequence was consumer credit was just quite frankly not a place to go get rich. 
It just wasn't because of the usury laws. Um, in 1980, they were effectively repealed. They weren't technically repealed. Part of them were and part of them not. We could go into the whole legal reason about what happened. But it's, a, it's an absolute pivot point. It was like knocking the tent pole down in the world of consumer credit. And so what happened is from 1980, this now starts the second period. And the second period is from 1980 to 2010. And what happens in that period is it's the Wild West. And whatever you can shoot, you can keep. And, uh, and, and over time, credit models actually change. It, the whole profit, the business model changes. So instead of being a world in which, well, this is what we charge for consumer credit, uh, I, I kind of screen my consumers, and I make good choices, and that's how I, I make a little profit as a, as a lender, whether it's a mortgage lender or a bank, however it was you were set up. What happens is the game fundamentally changes. And it changes to, led by the credit cards, but then quickly picked up by some of the payday lenders, then picked up by the mortgage industry. I will pretend to sell it to you at one price, and it's all in the fine print. And so the game becomes, I will pretend to sell it to you way below the usury rates, 3%, 2%, 0% financing. But what I've really done, because this is my business model, is I've put enough in the back end that what I'm doing is I'm buying a lottery ticket, right, as the lender. And there'll be a distribution. There'll be a few people who actually will end up getting this for 0%. It's like the games at the fair, right? For those of you who remember the state fair, few people actually win, right? But the rest of you will make this very, very profitable on the back end. And what it fundamentally does is it means, and no one can make the comparisons. We have a non-working market because it's all in the back part that you can't see. That ends with the new consumer agency. And we build going forward. Now, the question was, to be fair, I sort of skirted to the side of the question. The question was, can we go back to usury? The answer is, I've always said, usury should stay on the table. But the reality is, it's a blunter tool. And it's a tool, it's, it's a harder tool to work with. Yeah, you can put in caps. But we all now know the games, right? They've, they've learned the, the alternative ways to do this. So it's going to be a constant game of you've still got to find the ways to regulate or else somebody bounces above the cap. Ultimately, my view on this is the cap is not what drives it. What drives it is the business model underneath. And so the idea behind the new agency, we got an agency. This is critical. We did not get a single law. Right? If you're only going to get one bite at the apple, one law, you probably ought to go for a usury law. But we've got an agency, and that means we can take both a more refined and a more informed approach. It means it changes over time. As, as the industry morphs, as it, its products change, the point of having an agency is its products change. What the FDA does today is not what the FDA was doing 20 years ago. Right? You move in that direction. and so. My heart right now is in the idea that we can make this agency work. It's why I gave the speech I give tonight, though. We only make it work not only if we have good ideas on the side on credit, what it is we need to do about credit and how the credit market works, but if we think harder about agency design to make sure that this agency is always there, that it's smart, that it's vigilant, that it's transparent, that it belongs to the people. So that's why I put my money right now with the agency instead of a usury law. Okay. There are a number of questions about um, what you're anticipating in terms of um, the Republicans getting more power after this election, um, and um, also to, to how, you know, what you expect they might try and do, how you can block it, and also how to keep the agency from um, being totally captured by the, um, the people that it's supposed to be regulating. Right. OK. So um, this agency uh, has enemies. I know you're shocked to hear that, but it's true. 
There are those who would like to see this agency fail for political reasons. There are those who would like to see this agency fail for economic reasons. I'm guessing they have found each other. <laughs> so here's my view on that. Well, there it is. Um, it doesn't change a single thing I do tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, or the day after that. I, I now live in a world, but I lived in this world from the beginning. I live in a world in which every day working on this agency could be my last one. And so I'm in a sprint to get as much into this agency, as much built into the DNA of this agency to, to, to put it in the right direction so that it can grow in the right direction. We're hiring people. We're setting out policies. We are already figuring out how to make it open and transparent. My view is every single day that we do that is a day that this agency gets bigger, it gets better, it gets stronger, and it gets harder to walk it back. Um, it's not to say it won't happen, that it can't happen. Um, yeah, I'm afraid. I think there are those who want to pull the arms and legs off this agency so that it will be absolutely, I, I actually believe that no one will try to get it repealed. They'll just try to make it totally ineffective, take away all of its tools. If that day comes, uh, I will fight it. I will fight it every way I know how, and I will ask everybody in this country to fight it. I will, <laughs> yes. But for now, we are about the business of building an agency. And the best thing we can do as the bulwark against coming difficulties um, is to make this agency right and strong every single day. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I, what comes is what comes. And what fights are coming are what fights are coming. And I'm ready. We'll go to about 9.30, OK? And then stop. <laughs> OK. Um, somebody asks whether it's really impossible, whether it is really possible to eliminate the fine print on uh, credit uh, offers. <laughs> We're going to find out. <laughs> and actually, I really mean this. You tell me. Is there a better place to start this fight? Then just start it over the fine print. The notion that people can be mugged by contract <laughs> infuriates me. Um, well, think about it. What is it? It's that I want to be able to legally bind you, but I know you're not going to be able to read all that stuff. And so I hired a whole team of lawyers to write it and to put in whatever I wanted in it. And then I expect to be able to call the law to enforce it to be able to get judges to enforce it, to be able to come and seize your property, to be able to throw you out of your home, right? Based on whatever it is that's back in that fine print. And my view of it is, I am just old fashioned enough about contracts to believe that the whole premise behind contracts was both sides understood the deal. And so we're going to push in that direction. And if at the end of the day it can't happen, I want to be really clear here, then first of all, there are going to have to be a lot of people who are going to have to explain to the, Amer the American people why it can't happen. So I like having the discussion on those grounds. And the second is, do not forget, this is not the only tool of the agency. The agency has rulemaking authority. And we can go to the series of bad acts. It's happened. Right? This is what the CARD Act is about. It's taken 10 outrageous practices from the industry and said, no more. Those are over. And we can continue that line of regulation. The offer is to say on the table, the offer on the table is to say, can we write a simple contract that people can get? And we'll just see how that one plays out. I th my view is it is the right discussion to have. I think we can do it. And if we can't do it, I think we need to expose why not. So that's my view. OK. Uh, there are a couple of questions about um, 
what responsibility consumers have to um, avoid financial products they don't understand or getting overcommitted financially rather than just the banks on their side. So this is often a discussion. People want to say, um, and there are a lot of variations on this. This is all about financial literacy. You know, what we really need to do is we need to educate people better about money, uh, which I agree with. Uh, or this is people's fault. They, you know, they really went to the mall and they bought too much or they didn't understand the product. You shouldn't sign the product. I get that. But, but here are the couple of key pieces for me. The first one is these financial products are designed not to be read and understood. I mean, let's just be straightforward, right? Uh, 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 they are not supposed to be read, and that's what, that's what the, the lenders in many cases are counting on. So the idea that somehow it is the fault of the person on the other side, that somehow we're going to cure this. We are not going to cure, by the way, the, the complex product by better educating people. Uh, uh, I, I, I played this game a few years back with one of my um, 3L uh, uh, classes at Harvard. Uh, I had probably said a thing or two about credit cards in class. And, uh, and I had a student come into my office and throw down uh, one of these 3% uh, cash back. And he said, now, Professor Warren, even you'd have to agree, this one is a good deal. <laughs> and I said, well, let's see. So I went to the copying machine, made a copy for everybody, walked into my class. Now, these are all people who are about to graduate from law school. So these are almost lawyers, right? Everyone in the room has a college diploma and at least two and a half years of graduate training, right? I know statistically in that class, more than half would have had other advanced degrees. And I said, all I want you guys to do, I passed the thing out, I said, all I want you guys to do is figure out what's the price of credit in this contract and what does it take to get your 3% knocked off? And you can work together. And I want the answer. <laughs> they worked on it for more than 40 minutes and ultimately came up with what most people in the class thought was one of two right answers. <laughs> now think about that. I mean, you're just not going to educate beyond. That's not the, so, so the, peop, that's not the point, right? The point is the product is misdesigned. If, Forgive me, I have to always talk about toasters just a little bit. If toasters were exploding, we would not say people need better engineering degrees. <laughs> if only more Americans. No. The second part I want to say is, damn it, look how they sell these things. Zero percent financing. The whole point is to mislead, not to say, but guess what? You don't understand this contract. It's to hold the big words up in front. It's to put giant disclosures up front and then say, hmm, then there's that other stuff, right? Uh, you don't have to look at that. So uh, am I willing to say there's plenty of shared blame? Of course, there's, you know, there's plenty. What is it? There are many seats on the blame train or whatever that is. You know, there's, look, there are people who spend too much money. Yep. There are people who need to learn better. All of us need to learn better how to manage our finances. Financial literacy is one of the platforms that this, this new agency can create. I'm really excited about the opportunities associated with that. I'm very committed. But that is no substitute for putting honest and fair products on the market, period. Um, Will you have a website to receive information from consumers, and will someone read the information? So, so it's, a, it's a really good question, because this is something I'm, I'm actually struggling with right now and, and, and meeting with people about this. We don't have a website right now, actually, for a reason. Um, we've already had people say, ah, I'll put a website up for you. And it will have FAQs, you know. And <laughs> this is our chance to come out into the public. And so there's a, there's a very serious question about what it ought to look like, what we ought to be doing. Um, if we want people to have ownership of this agency, then we got to do that from the first step. So what I'm working on right now, uh, and I don't, I, I, I want to be careful about how far I go here because I, it's, um, 
<laughs> I was going to say it's not my decision to make. Crap, I think it is my decision to make. <laughs> huh. OK. So <laughs> here's the deal. Uh, hmm. So I'm so used to the world, OK, in a different way. OK, so here's the thing. I think that our first step as an agency has to be to ask Americans to come in and tell us more about what's going on, but to do it in a meaningful way. I, I'm really touched by the fact that the way the question is written is not just do you want to hear from us, it's are you actually listening when the information comes in. And so what I'm, I'm working on and, and just kind of trying to think through and trying to get some really good experts to talk to me about is how you set it up so there's some good, solid, uh, let's do them as check off the box questions, because they're very easy to collate and to put out there, to create heat maps, to do, so people can see what's happening and, and to whom it is happening. So let's get some information about the people who are willing to talk to us and the credit products that they want to talk about and who the issuers of those credit products are and what kind of experiences they have. So I'm very interested in this question. And I think if we do it right and we get enough Americans to write and tell us in this agency, this becomes, think about the power of what we could do just with one open up and tell us in a way that we can easily, I'm not asking for any individual uh, information to identify any individual information, but to be able to say things like, here's what's happening to males between the ages of 18 and 26. They're really getting targeted for a particular kind of product. Uh, here's where Latino families have had some really extraordinary problems. Here are zip codes that are producing certain kinds of problems. I think the power of these data just to identify, I understand it's not a perfectly random sample, I get all that, but the reality of being able to say to each other, to ourselves, to, to see where you fit in all of those pieces, to see where your neighbors fit in all those pieces, for the media to be able to pick it up, for bloggers to be able to pick it up and talk about it. I think this is a powerful way for us to start. And so I'm very, I, I'm trying to move in this direction and move there with, with some speed. But I want to say a second part. And that's the part about we do this because it's a way to collect data and make sure we've got them and we can tell them and use them. There also always has to be a place for the story. Um, I'm a serious data gal. Uh, I use lots of anonymous data sets. But we can never forget the human story that backs up every one of those numbers. Uh, <sighs> I did my first study of families that filed for bankruptcy in the early 1980s. And I did it with a sociologist and another law professor. And it was data out of court records. We hand coded data out of court records, drew it together, and then ultimately turned it in, into a book about who was going broke in America. When we did our, but it, it was numbers, that's what we had. When we did our second, got ready to go back and do a second study. We asked people to fill out questionnaires in the bankruptcy courts. We were told this would be impossible, that you could never get people to do it. Nobody would want to participate. It's too embarrassing. It's, you know, it's it, it, a hundred reasons why this couldn't happen. Well, we got some judges to cooperate with us, and their clerks handed out forms. And I was, at the time, I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, and we just started getting boxes of handwritten. And what they were was on the front, they were just more of the kind of data I'd had before, only stuff we'd never had, like demographic information. So for the first time, we got age, we got um, uh, gender, we got uh, race, uh, it, we got family size, so that you could tell a lot more about the people. But the last question was a one pager. And the last question was, t please turn this over, and in your own words, just tell us why you're filing for bankruptcy. And not everybody wrote on the back, but I picked up a handful of these. I was going to get on a plane, and I, had, I hadn't looked at any of them. 
And I was going to go down and meet Terry and Jay, my co-authors. And they said, we're going to have to figure out how to code the date on the back. I mean, it's, as anyone knows who's ever dealt with data, this, this, is like, this is like from hell in terms of coding. But we're going to give it a try. So I picked up a fistful of these. I got on an airplane. And I started looking at the back sheets. And I sat on that plane. And I started reading those stories. And I still remember them about people whose children had died. And they'd spend everything they had and run up debts just to try to save them. There were stories about, about lost jobs and broken dreams. And sure, I know a cynic would read the stories and say, ah, they only tell you the self-serving part. They don't tell you about the stupid things people did. But the truth is, they told a story about who we are and what we ultimately believe as Americans. They told a story of people who work hard, who have big dreams, who sometimes fall flat on their faces, and who, despite it all, scratch it all back together, pull themselves up, and say, I'm here to declare that I failed. I failed in that big American economic game. I can't do it. I can't pay it off, but I'm coming back. I'm going to write this one off. I'm going to put it behind me. I'm going to turn a corner, and I'm going to live the rest of my life going forward. I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to work hard. And best of all, I'm going to keep on dreaming. And so whatever we do, we're going to do data like crazy, but we're never going to forget the stories of all the people that we represent. Um, we are at such a moment to build something that both changes us and in many ways just makes us more of who we are, our, our best side. Thank you all for being here with me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.